Welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. Last episode, some escalations and shows of force seem to have egged on the Cold War a bit, but something along the lines of mutually assured destruction has kept the tension from being pulled further for the time being. For now, the peaceful exploration of space can continue, starting with a small commercial satellite launched from Wallops, Virginia. success, the Ajana satellite is now handed over to a happy customer. September 21st, 1966, it's open launch season for Jupiter in Brownsville, Texas. A newly upgraded level 6 tracking station and a new communications dish powered by an array of radioisotope thermoelectric generators has been the dawn of a new age in space exploration. The Chiton 3E sits ready to launch a deep space probe, aptly named Traveler 1, towards Jupiter and beyond. Its long-term goal will be to utilize Jupiter's gravity well to slingshot into the outer solar system and beyond. But it all starts here, with two 1205 boosters roaring to life on the pad. Despite a Kentar thermal panel becoming lodged inside of some structure underneath the upper stage, Traveler 1 reaches near-orbital speeds without issue. All that's left is a final burn from Kentar before maneuver plotting for Jupiter can begin. Now, the probe itself only has a small amount of fuel on board for mid-course corrections. Kentar has to burn near perfectly for us to even have a chance for success down the road. Timing and speed is everything for this to work. Targeting Neptune from here, even the slightest pulse of our RCS will move our relative distance from Neptune millions of kilometers. But luckily for us, we've done it. Our course is set. We hoist our sails and take a look at the Earth as it slowly shrinks in size in the all-encompassing blackness around it. Traveler 1 will never see the Earth again. October 13, 1966. A lone K-38 Talon, piloted by Thomas Stafford Kerman, command module pilot for the previous Trinity 5 mission, orbits a stacked and readied Catern 5, awaiting backup crew ingress for the Trinity 6 mission later in the night. The inaugural flight of our new trainer aircraft making for an irresistible photo op. Down on the ground, eagerly awaiting a shared launch window to the lunar plane, another Chiton 3E holds Traveler 2 in its payload fairing. Tonight, our mission control teams are going to have their hands full, as these two marvels of Kerbal engineering destined for the exploration of the heavens are scheduled to lift off merely 10 minutes apart from one another.
of our missions have reached orbit successfully. The double night launch stress now off the shoulders of launch control. At this point, however, the problems begin. Traveler 2 experiences an anomaly in the last few moments of its transjovian injection. As Kentar reached the end of its burn, a shift in attitude and strange control problems has placed Traveler 2's trajectory close enough to Jupiter to be pulled by its gravity, but not close enough to be shot into the outer solar system, and too far for the probe's minuscule amount of fuel to correct. Traveler 2 will be stranded, although valuable data from Jupiter should still be collectible when it does fly by from a distance, so it's not a total loss. Trinity 6 has also experienced an anomaly. It will later be discovered that the Catern 5 lifted off with simultaneously too little and too much fuel on board. The first stage slightly underfueled, coupled with the descent stage of our lander slightly overfueled, has left us with a bit of a problem. A 600 meters per second shy of translunar injection kind of problem. The immediate and most obvious solution would be to abort. And this is when viewers in Twitch chat began begging me to turn around and go home. It's not worth the risk, yada yada. So, do I? No, of course not. Here at the Astro Foundation, we do not tuck our tail between our legs and jot down almost on a mission report. Unacceptable. With the Soviet Union space program currently experiencing a gap in crewed lunar missions waiting for their new, bigger, badder, heavy launch vehicle, we need to make the most of our lunar supremacy. And no 600 meters per second fuel shortage is going to stop us. We have two perfectly good propulsion modules to utilize and make up the difference. The command module and the lunar descent module. Utilizing both of these is obviously going to jeopardize our ability to land on the moon and more importantly, our ability to return to the Earth afterwards. But unlike this chat character, who clearly does not believe in our brute force resolve to cause and then solve our own unnecessary problems in the name of progress and efficiency, we have the Kraken given right to respond to this, in all honesty, valid cause for concern with an Uno reverse car. Because we are capable, we are going, we'll figure it out, and we'll bring it all home. Soviet cosmonauts are nearly home from a trip around Venus, for crying out loud. Aborting a moon landing at this point in time would be a disaster for our reputation. So, with our minds set and our fuel spent, we're once again on target for the moon. Crunching the numbers, it looks risky at best, but hey, that's where we truly shine. Quite literally. Uh, if you didn't see the previous text on screen, this entire mission was streamed and recorded on April Fool's Day, and the developer of Waterfall has hard-coded rainbow rocket plumes as an April Fool's joke. I decided not to go changing it for the sheer silliness of that, and the fact that we have missions going poorly just adds to that silliness if you ask me. Uh, the VODs for these missions are on my Twitch channel as well if you want to watch the 20-some hours of raw footage captured, linked in the description below. I think I might just livestream all of this series from now on, so come and say hi if you're interested in the real-time, in-depth, behind-the-scenes interaction as I forge these videos together one low frame rate launch at a time. Did I happen to mention our landing site is on the far side of the moon yet? Eugene and Fred have successfully landed on the lunar surface. Jack remains in orbit of the moon, able to communicate with the Earth during near-side transit, and able to communicate with the Kerpenots on the moon for mere minutes at a time. 
the two get to work assembling their lunar rover in preparation for their long drive ahead. We landed 17 kilometers from a series of waypoints these lunar contracts give us to traverse through, so without the LRV, we would not be able to fulfill our mission and get paid. So, it's a good idea to drive this thing as carefully as... Oh no. Ah, great. W well, there goes one of the wheels. And some onboard equipment. Uh, well, it could be worse. Uh, as soon as we can figure out how to flip this thing over somehow, uh, we can still somewhat balance on three wheels and keep on trucking. As we reach speeds higher than 12 meters per second though, well, our rover turns into a sled. The entire journey took a couple of hours in game, and that moment right there was absolutely me reading chat and not paying close attention. Thank Kraken for all-wheel drive and all-wheel steering. We made it to every waypoint, and we made it back to the limb. That's all that matters. The rest, well, uh, nobody has to know. We're on the far side of the moon, so it's not like our situation was being monitored all that closely. You know, speaking of, if something worse would have happened today, I'm not sure how easily mission control back on Earth would figure it out. Maybe it's best we don't land on the far side anymore. Ah, uh, well, all things considered, there was a 0% chance of a rescue flight no matter where we land on the moon. So the dangers are always present, and the risk is never not there. Uh, which brings us to our journey back home, and where our rejection of mission abort during TLI rears its head. That's right, now I have to deal with the consequences of my own actions. Unbelievable. Unless we have exactly enough fuel in the CSM to get us most of the way there, with a six-day lunar orbit that barely reaches the edge of the moon's SOI, and enough RCS fuel to get us the rest of the way on the second orbit, in such a way that gets us home with merely hours of supplies remaining. Hey, well, would you look at that? But we aren't out of the woods yet. After launching with problems causing an underfueled orbital vehicle, utilizing the lander and service module to finish the translunar injection burn, limping back to the lunar lander in a half-destroyed LRV, and achieving a lunar return with no fuel left whatsoever, we arrive at Earth Interface. Re-entry. The final step of our Hellblaze. And we're out of fuel for the re-entry thrusters. Yeah, one of the measures I utilized earlier to lose weight in order to make sure our RCS thrusters packed enough of a punch to get us home was to dump excess fuel that I thought was only in the service module. And I accidentally dumped our re-entry fuel that was in the command module as well. So that's overboard. That one's on me. My bad. All we can do is kind of control our descent with the center of mass slider, crossing our fingers that the aerodynamics actually points us the right way. And hope for the best. We're out of supply, so if we bounce off the atmosphere entirely, we're done for. Also, the ocean kind of disappeared, so uh, this is going to be an interesting splashdown if we survive.
by some miracle, or simply the prowess of our capsule engineers. No RCS? No problem. Trinity 6 has made it back home, safe and sound, surviving the crazy ordeal that they went through. Now I have another rocket launch I was going to cover, our first ever launch of the Catern 1B, but it's gonna have to wait for the next episode as I am out of editing time entirely. Uh, if it's not obvious by the editing somehow, let's just say that I'm up past my bedtime. Thank you all so much for watching. Special shout out to Xenon, Chris Gebert, Darth Malakor, Williams Plays, Elliot Ewing, Guy Called Odin, Mr. Blue Star, and everyone else on the Patreon for your support. I love you all. Get more sleep than I do. And peace out.